Well, it's uh, really great to have Dr. Eric Osborne join us today for Cardiology Grand Rounds. This will be our last Grand Rounds of the season. Uh, next uh, week, we'll have a, a faculty meeting uh, in lieu of Grand Rounds. Um, so Dr. Osborne is a fellow Dukey, um, having received his uh, initial bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Duke. Uh, he then went on to get a master's in mechanical engineering at MIT, followed by an MD-PhD as part of the health science technology program at uh, Harvard and MIT. Um, he then joined uh, the Beth Israel Deaconess um, uh, Hospital uh, for his internship, residency, clinical fellowship, um, and has since been uh, working in both clinical and research capacities uh, on our interventional cardiology faculty. Um, Dr. Osborne has a very long-standing history in intravascular imaging and applications to uh, um, percutaneous coronary intervention. And so thank you so much, Eric, for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your updates on intracoronary imaging. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be able to uh, talk to you today about uh, intracoronary imaging. Here are my disclosures. So uh, the talk that I'll give today is broken down really into two segments. Um, part one is going to focus on current clinical practice. And, uh, you know, I'll start with a rationale for why we use imaging guidance, describe some of this, you know, the current technology uh, go through the anatomy of how we use imaging to optimize PCI results, and then finally review some new knowledge that's been emerging over the past few years in acute coronary syndromes and stent failure that's provide, been provided by imaging. In the second part of the talk, um, we'll delve a little bit more into some of my research areas um, uh, that I've been working on the past few years uh, in the lab of my mentor, Farouk Jaffer, helping to develop and validate new catheter-based imaging systems um, to image not only structure um, like we do clinically, but also pathobiology and living subjects using near infrared fluorescence, including some applications and, and hopefully some prospects also for clinical translation. So, but you know, before we start to discuss uh, imaging during PCI, I think it's important to step back a little bit and recognize that um, despite how good our stent implantation techniques and our current stents are, that stent failure still is an ongoing problem. And so even for our you know, top of the line uh, current generation stents, uh, stent failure still occurs in a few percent of patients per year. And I think most disturbingly, um, if you look at these curves, it appears to continue almost indefinitely. Um, and in fact, if you look at these studies, about one in six patients with second generation DES are impacted by target lesion failure at five years. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of iterations and improvements in stent design, but, you know, perhaps, um, you know, making thinner stents, new polymer coatings, et cetera, um, we've somewhat, you know, plateaued in that area. Um, there may be new breakthroughs or Perhaps, you know, bioabsorbable stents will come and eliminate metal altogether, although that has not worked out um, at present. Um, but I think, you know, we can still do better with the tools that we have available right now in the cath lab, and we can hopefully make a dent in this trajectory by using intracoronary imaging to guide uh, stent implantation. So you know, part, of the, part of the problem, I think, is that even at present day, we continue to rely too heavily on angiography alone. We all know that angiography has significant limitations, um, but uh, we still use it every day um, in the majority of cases as standalone for PCI guidance. So with angio, we're stuck with two-dimensional views of the lumen. So eccentric plaques can be deceptive um, depending on the viewing angle as shown in this left main lesion. <clears throat> and what may look like a relatively normal lumen can in fact have areas that do appear normal or areas that are, have significant positively remodeled plaque. Um, so in the end, you know, I think um, the stents are so good, our techniques are really good, we get away with it for most patients, but there is a subset of patients, like I mentioned, that do suffer from suboptimal sub stent implantation, and whether that be restenosis or from underexpansion or thrombosis from an unrecognized stent edge dissection. But these are scenarios I think where imaging guidance can, can really help us out and take us to the next level. I don't know if there are any fans out there of this you know, Harrison Ford movie from uh, many years ago now, but uh, with intracoronary imaging, you know, we can 
really more precisely characterize you know, what lies beneath the lumen surface. And we can use this information to plan and optimize PCI results. And because with, with lumen angiography, um, really we're, we're just only looking at the tip, tip of the iceberg. So here's a list of you know, some of the scenarios where imaging can be beneficial. Um, I'm a very big proponent, and I think we're learning a lot more about this, um, uh, pre-PCI imaging. Uh, this can provide a really a lot of information up front that impacts the whole rest of the procedure. Naturally, if you choose the wrong size stent uh, from the beginning, um, you can't take it back. Uh, Pre-PCI pre imaging also improves uh, workflow, workflow efficiency for selecting equipment, you know, exactly the sizes and lengths of equipment that you need. Um, how about stent failure? Well, that's another area where a lot of us think um, it's essentially mandatory now uh, to image. You really need to understand why the first stent failed before you think about putting in a second one. Post-stent optimization. Um, that's where, um, in the real world, most imaging is performed uh, currently. And um, the stent stand, you're focused on maximizing stent expansion, ensuring that the struts are fully opposed to the wall, et cetera. But finally, uh, you know, an area where imaging can be very helpful is to look at complications or areas of angiographic ambiguity. So that's where it's often used as well. So these are the current options available for clinical um, intracoronary imaging. Um, intravascular ultrasound or IVIS and optical coherence tomography or OCT. Both of these are catheter based and they're generally performed pretty similarly, uh, but there are a few notable differences that I'll highlight here. So IVIS has overall better penetration depth, uh, meaning the field of view is much bigger, it can see through plaques better, and uh, it can image through blood, whereas OCT requires blood displacement, typically with viscous contrast injection, but one of the big benefits of OCT imaging is that it has at least tenfold better resolution than IVIS. So in most cases, use of IVIS or OCT is based on personal preference and comfort, but there are some of these intrinsic characteristics that lend themselves to certain scenarios where uh, an imaging modality may be better. For instance, IVIS, large vessels, um, osteolesions where it may be challenging to, to flush uh, contrast with OCT and clear the lumen. Whereas OCT is much better in the near field, uh, looking at lumen irregularities and stents. And as I'll show you later, later um, um, uh, you know, many people think that IVIS is excellent or ultrasound is excellent at looking at calcium, but OCT is actually even better um, because the infrared light can penetrate through the calcium. Um, so you can uh, not only measure things like calcium arc, but you can actually measure calcium thickness. So um, in an attempt to compete with OCT, IVIS has come out with better resolution systems. Um, uh, this has been achieved with higher frequency 60 megahertz transducers. Um, however, the trade-off being a, a little bit decrease in field depth. Stent visibility is shown here. Here's a stent strut by high definition IVIS compared to standard IVIS um, is improved. Um, and uh, we're a little bit better at identified dissections and possibly thrombus. Um, but I, I'd be you know, remiss if I didn't really compare um, these with OCT, um, which has much better resolution. Um, and so things like intimal flaps due to dissections are much easier seen with OCT, as well as uh, more subtle um, aspects like malaposition, where these sense struts aren't fully opposed to the vessel wall or there's tissue prolapsing between the struts. So not to be outdone, OCT is uh, still pushing the boundaries further um, as far as resolution uh, with the development of micro OCT. Um, this has been developed in Gary Tierney's lab, who's one of our research collaborators, and I'll talk about some of that work later. But the resolution of this is really pretty remarkable, um, and uh, it gets down to cellular level identification. So this green area demonstrates a macrophage uh, within a plaque, and the red area shows a cholesterol crystal identified by its characteristic dimensions. The endothelium can also be uh, imaged with micro OCT, and this is a 3D rendering of the endothelial monolayer compared to an electron micros uh, microscopy image. And so this is a relatively slow uh, imaging system, but it, with improvements in speed and et cetera, um, you know, there may be future clinical applications of this um, to better understand uh, 
say, stent, stent strut healing and endothelialization, or maybe even plaque erosion um, during acute coronary syndromes where the endothelium is disrupted. So um, I'll spend a little bit of time just talking about hybrid imaging, because um, these, are, these are imaging catheters that combine uh, different technologies, and they're designed to reap the advantages um, of each modality. Um, these are becoming more prevalent in the clinical space, and I, this is a trend that I expect to continue. It's an area that you know, um, our research focuses on as well. Um, so for instance, um, this is a hybrid IVUS OCT system that's clinically available. Um, it provides exactly co-registered IVUS and OCT images. And uh, they, were, they did this by um, engineering the uh, imaging head to integrate an OCT optical fiber and ultrasound transducer together. Um, this is a rotational catheter. It can run in two modes, either IVUS alone or IVUS plus OCT. Another example is shown on the right. Um, uh, this combines IVUS with near-infrared spectroscopy, uh, which is a very sensitive method to detect lipid-rich lesions uh, with high specificity. Um, in spectroscopy, um, the yellow regions here show areas that are very lipid, where si substantial lipid pools are present. And this was the first demand case report now from about 10 years ago, where um, this lesion was stented and it led to a paraprocedural MI. Um, uh, suspected to be due to distal embolization of the lipid contents. So I think one of the biggest technological breakthroughs that we've had over the past few years, though, with imaging has been in the progression of the software and software automation. Um, so the software now can exactly, at least with OCT, can exactly co-register the imaging data with the angiogram. And this functionally gives you a hybrid OCT angio view. So gone are the days um, where we had to look at the imaging console, count side branches and other fiducial markers to find out where you were. Um, and so here's an example of a co-registered OCT angio pullback. And here the operator has used bookmarks to identify the um, location uh, where the stent is placed. And then the software is automatically uh, placed corresponding blue brackets um, on the angiogram that shows exactly where we need to go to fully cover the lesion. And in fact, um, study the Optico study looked at um, the software tool and found that um, using this compared to angiography alone led to about a 60% reduction in geographic miss. So these advances are all all great, but you know, I think more importantly is whether um, imaging impacts what we do during uh, PCI. And this IVUS study um, assessed how clinical decision making was impacted by intracoronary imaging. And what they found was that nearly three quarters of the time, interventionalists did something different based on what they saw um, on the imaging study. And this was most often choosing a different size stent or balloon. But it also uh, led um, uh, at times to uh, perform a, more post dilatation to make the stent bigger or even cover a suboptimal area with an additional stent. Similarly, for OCT, uh, clinical decision making was impacted by intracoronary imaging in about two thirds of procedures. Uh, the biggest impact uh, was observed with pre PCI imaging enabling the operator to choose the right stent um, or um, in certain cases alter how they were going to do the lesion preparation, um, either to a more aggressive uh, method or sometimes a less aggressive, aggressive method if there's no significant calcification. So, you know, I think there's, there's pretty good data um, now that um, imaging um, influences procedural uh, decisions, but of course, you know, the larger question is, um, do these extra steps with imaging just cost us time and money or do they in fact translate into improved clinical outcomes? So to, to get at this, I'll just highlight a couple of the recent randomized trials that support imaging guided PCI over angiography alone. Um, the first um, uh, I'll talk about is IVUS XPL, um, which was a study of patients with long uh, lesions that were treated with current generation DES. Um, we know that long lesions lead to a greater risk of stent failure. In this study, the average stent length was, was in fact pretty long, almost 40 millimeters of stent. And remarkably, despite what was a relatively modest increase in the final stent diameter in the IVUS arm, IVUS guidance demonstrated a 50% reduction in MACE at 12 months over angiography alone. 
And this was primarily driven by a reduction in target lesion revascularization. And we now have longer term follow-up data shown here on the right that was published earlier this year. And the benefit of imaging guidance from this study persists out to five years. So the other study uh, I'll talk about is ULTIMATE. Um, this is a more recent study, a group of all comers that were randomized to IVUS or angio guidance uh, during uh, PCI. They were treated uh, with a mix of both first and second generation DES. And um, in this study, um, I think importantly, high pressure post-dilatation was uh, made mandatory in both groups, uh, which wasn't the case in other studies. But similar to IVUS XPL, there was a 50% reduction again in target vessel failure at 12 months. And this was driven by uh, significantly less target lesion revascularization. So looking at meta-analysis data of the multiple IVUS studies, IVUS trials out there, um, further supports less target lesion revascularization with imaging guided PCI over angiography alone. Um, this study on the left uh, was one that Duane and I recently published looking at 19 studies um, with over 27,000 patients um, favors, favoring IVUS guided uh, PCI. Similarly, a meta-analysis of only the randomized data um, with more than 5,000 patients shown here on the right, favored imaging guided PCI with a risk ratio of um, 0.59. So, I mean, I think putting it all together, there's, there's a healthy amount of data suggests that imaging guidance leads to less need for down the road repeat revascularization. So one, one important point that um, I'll mention as far as um, this data, it's all based on IVUS guided PCI studies. And you know, OCT is the new kid on the block, and we think logically that OCT guided PCI should perform similar to IVUS. And that is, as long as OCT can offer at least IVUS like results, um, there is a lack of randomized data to support this at present. And, and not to get too far into the weeds on this, but I, I think. Um, the question of whether OCT and IVUS provide similar sizing actually turns out to be relatively important and practical for what we do every day using OCT. So studies comparing OCT and IVUS measurements um, uh, relative to phantom plastic tubes have been performed of known size. And what they found is that the OCT sizing uh, runs smaller than IVUS. Um, it's more true to size. And in fact, IVUS always tends to be a bit bigger um, than OCT and bigger than the reference tube by about eight to 10%. It also has greater measurement variability. Um, and this is thought to be due to the um, lower resolution of IVUS uh, to determine the um, uh, surface, uh, the lumen surface. And this, this does become important though, um, and uh, it's bore out in clinical studies that um, if you size equipment um, based on the lumen with both IVUS and OCT, you're going to end up with a smaller um, end result um, when you use OCT. So this concept uh, uh, in a series of trials called the Illumian trials led to the development of an EEM-based or um, based stent sizing algorithm for OCT that was uh, demonstrated to give IVUS-like stent expansion. So here are a couple examples on the right. Um, of how we might do sizing here is using the mean lumen diameter. And uh, here's using the mean diameter of the um, external elastic membrane. And so if you size based on the image on the left, you might implant a smaller two, maybe 2.25 millimeter stent. But if you use EEM sizing, um, then you can feel comfortable using a larger uh, two and a half millimeter stent safely. And so um, what we found is that this additional gain in lumen area has a direct relationship you know, with the likelihood for restenosis down the road. So there's currently a large randomized trial as part of uh, the Illumian studies um, of OCT guided versus angiography guided PCI. Um, and they're using this EEM based sizing scheme I just outlined. And this should help answer the question as to whether OCT leads to improved clinical outcomes. Um, the trial is gonna be over 3,600 uh, uh, complex patients, those with uh, ACS, diabetes, as well as complex lesions or long calcified multivessel disease, um, et cetera, with uh, primary endpoints being final minimal stent area um, after PCI and uh, target vessel failure out to two years. So, um, you know, despite 
despite this evidence that has showed you, I think, um, and most of it being recent, uh, granted, historically, you know, outside of academic medical centers, intracoronary imaging has been used pretty infrequently. Um, this was a study over 10 years, um, up until 2014 at least, um, over 3 million angiograms in the U.S. Imaging was uh, performed in under 5% of cases, um, heavily dominated by IVIS. Um, like I said, OCT really just kind of came out in the past decade. Um, the other finding was that if you stratify this by number of cases by hospitals, um, there's a lot of variability um, and use with a few early adopters doing the majority of cases and the others just um, you know, doing very few. Um, and so, you know, as the case with any other tech, you know, technologies, practice does make perfect and to get really good at using imaging, you know, it's important to do more than just a, a couple cases per year. But what about more recently? So after IVIS XPL and Ultimate were published, um, there has been a bump in imaging use across the country. Um, but overall, it still remains relatively small uh, proportion. Um, IVIS tends to hover. Um, around 10 to 12 percent, with even fewer senders um, shown in blue using OCT, although adoption, because probably because OCT is so new, is increasing at a faster rate um, nationwide. So what about looking at our own data? Um, well, this is kind of interesting, you know, relative to our total PCI volume, which has been stable. Um, over the years, uh, we have seen a significant increase in imaging use within the past uh, two to three years. Um, it used to be a pretty rare event, I would say, uh, to have an imaging case presented at interventional conference, but now it's pretty commonplace um, and typically occurs every week. Um, and looking at the data a different way as shown on the right as a percent of cases, you know, compared to invasive physiology use here in gray, uh, which has been fairly stable at around 15 to 20 percent, IVIS OCT use has seen a significant climb from about 5 percent uh, back in 2015 to around 25 percent in the last uh, fiscal year. And even this year, despite the downtime related to COVID, we're, we're currently on pace to perform over 300 intracoronary imaging cases. So I think uh, people are recognizing the utility um, of imaging using it more often. So let's, uh, let's move on to just some practical steps of how we use imaging during uh, PCI. And um, essentially, um, there are two general phases. Um, the first being before we put in the stent, and of course the second, um, optimizing this afterwards. So there's three main components of pre-PCI imaging, and these involve lesion characterization, determining reference vessel sizes, and then using this information efficiently, hopefully, to and upfront to choose which stent and post dilatation balloons are needed to complete the job. So the goal, um, of course, of, of this process is to cover, uh, nor cover the lesion from you know, a normal part of the vessel to another normal part of the vessel, and also to right size the stent. Um, lesion characteriz characterization, I'll just spend you know, a little bit of time in is, is performed uh, based on understanding how OCT light interacts with different tissue types. You know, this can really be the, probably the most challenging part um, of this process to identify which bucket um, to place the uh, plaque into of the three major plaque types, whether it be calcified, fibrous, or lipid. But these all look very different by OCT, and you can, um, uh, you can uh, determine that um, uh, relatively um, easily. So in particular, I just focus a little bit on uh, calcified plaques because um, it's really critical to have a very uh, comprehensive understanding of plaque calcium. Um, since if you have uh, undertreated or improperly treated major calcium, this is going to restrict stent expansion and uh, put the patient at risk of stent complications. Um, the amount and location of calcium by imaging um, can play uh, role in upfront decision making, um, whether it's um, deeply located, whether it's nodular uh, calcium uh, penetrating the lumen or more superficial. Um, and, uh, you know, that can lead to decision making up front as to um, uh, the need for more aggressive plaque modification and what type of plaque modification to do. Um, 
Um, taking this just a step further um, uh, in a more objective approach, uh, a risk score uh, was recently proposed for determining uh, the likelihood of stent expansion based on OCT calcium imaging. It's relatively simple. You uh, just sum up the points um, uh, that you get as shown here for calcium angle, thickness, and calcium length, uh, with four being the maximum. So here are a couple examples of a low calcium score, uh, of, of low and high calcium scores um, pre and post uh, stent implantation. Um, so the top panels show a low calcium score of one. Um, this has an area of thick, but a relatively small angle of calcium. And in this case, excellent stent expansion was achieved at around 97%. If you compare that to the high calcium score um, shown at the bottom, <clears throat> This had a calcium score of four. Um, it um, has a very thick layer of calcium uh, that extends um, into in a large angle, um, and it's also relatively deep. And in this case, um, after stent implantation, um, they only achieved 68% expansion, and it was a highly eccentric uh, expansion. Essentially, the stent sort of expanded in this area where the calcium was absent and didn't expand elsewhere. So I would just you know, mention as well, interestingly, if you just use angiography to look at this, depending on the angle that you're looking at, so you're looking from this angle, um, this may not look so severely underexpanded um, uh, um, uh, without using imaging to really understand what the 3D anatomy is. So another uh, pretty rich area for imaging uh, is in better understanding uh, uh, mechanisms of acute coronary syndrome. And um, this has been done through a, you know, a series of OCT imaging registry studies. And uh, just to highlight some of the, um, some, of the um, some examples, um, it, acute coronary syndrome in NSTEMI um, was found to be more often due to plaque erosion, uh, particularly uh, being the case in younger patients and women. And Typically, this looks like uh, the image shown here on the right, um, where you have a fibrous plaque uh, on OCT with a roughened uh, luminal surface that may have an overlying thrombus. Um, this is a white thrombus, so we can see through it with OCT. Um, and this is in contrast to mechanisms in STEMI in which prototypical plaque rupture is more frequent. And this here is an example of plaque rupture. The yellow area shows a break in the thin fibrous cap that um, sealed the lipid core contents um, shown here that have now been released into the lumen. So we've also been learning a lot about mechanisms of stent failure um, from imaging registries and at least for restenosis, uh, the most common mechanism is stent under expansion. This is about half of the cases and this is uh, most often due to untreated calcium. Uh, for stent thrombosis, though, um, the, the, the suspected cause shifts over time uh, from uh, exposed metal struts early on uh, to more neoaposclerosis in very late cases. Um, notably, um, I think you know, the authors in these studies were able to define the probable failure mechanism in almost all the cases they examined. So, you know, I think a take-home message uh, from this is that if we do image stent failure routinely, um, the majority of the time, I think most of us will be able to figure out why the stent failed. We don't need to, we don't need to guess. And, um, you know, this can go beyond just defining um, why the stent failed, but we can use the mode of failure to tailor our treatment more specifically um, at the underlying cause. So here's this example workflow um, that was put together for stent restenosis where um, if we follow this and the dominant failure mechanism is due to under expansion, um, which is the most common reason for stent failure, and uh, let's say there's little neointimal hyperplasia, then a pretty rational approach may be to simply start with additional stent expansion using high pressure balloons. And depending on the results, you know, you may or may not need to implant an additional stent. So the final steps of image guided PCI involve optimizing the result. Um, so you don't leave, uh, leave behind a significant edge dissection. Um, make sure the stent's fully against the vessel wall and well expanded. 
Um, again, like I said before, proper expansion may be the most critical component for long-term stent patency. Um, this is older data on bare metal stents, but I think the concept remains true that, you know, as you improve the stent lumen area, um, there's less risk of restenosis. Um, and uh, as the stent gets very large, um, though, there's diminishing returns as far as benefits of making it even bigger. That generally inflection occurs around about a three and a half millimeter diameter stent. So one way um, uh, we're working presently to try to improve our understanding of the tangible benefits of imaging guidance is through a unique industry pro industry sponsored initiative uh, called uh, the Light Lab Project. Just a sec. Um, we're part of a consortium of twelve academic centers nationwide that are collaborating to pool data on how we use OCT imaging currently and how uh, introduction of standardized workflows impact procedural efficiency, decision-making, and safety. Um, we have our own site, our own on-site field clinical engineer um, that's helping collect and analyze, you know, a lot of uh, different data, looking at sizing, number of balloon stents used, angioviews, contrast radiation. Um, they then feed that data back to us individually and also as a group so we can understand our local practice patterns. But then of course, it's also pooled with the other sites. Um, as a site, we're sort of just getting started. Uh, we're still on the phase, phase one of the <laughs> project, uh, but um, we're already seeing some interesting findings come out of the group as a whole. And um, I'll just share with you just some of the very early pooled results demonstrating a signal that using OCT with angio co-registration can lead to a significant uh, or a reduction in the number of angio views needed um, in the range of 40, 40%. And the natural downstream effects of this um, result in the possible uh, safety improvements uh, with slightly less contrast and radiation use. And furthermore, if you um, use OCT sizing based on pre-PCI imaging, um, operators seem to be a little bit more efficient with picking the right size and length stent up front. And this may lead to a slight reduction in the number of stents and balloons needed. Now, this is, of course, early data, um, uh, but if it you know, holds up, um, there is a chance that, it, you know, may, that OCT may generate some time savings and cost reduction at the time of stent implantation. Um, I would say that um, the, you know, the first formal results from at least the decision-making subgroup of this project were shared with us in a conference call earlier this week, and they look pretty promising. Um, they're gonna present the results at uh, virtual Europe PCR in June in one of the late, in the late breaking trial uh, innovation sessions. So um, we look forward to seeing that. So uh, one final plug I'd like to make before moving on to the next part of the talk is that, you know, under the guidance of uh, Jeff and now, and now Duane, we're in the process of starting an OCD core lab here as part of the larger offerings um, of the angiographic core lab. Um, our uh, inaugural study will be a restenosis trial, coronary restenosis trial, um, that's randomizing patients to treatment with a novel sirolimus eluding coronary balloon or standard of care intervention. Um, we'll be course, analyzing data from the OCC subgroup to look at stent failure mechanisms and quantify results pre and post intervention. So I think, you know, this is a really exciting venture um, for us, and it should also create new opportunities for OCT image analysis and clinical trial investigation. So in summary, I'll just uh, uh, end part one here. Um, imaging guided PCI improves patient outcomes and it's provided key information on mechanisms of stent failure in ACS. In addition, I'll just mention as a, as a um, segue into the next part, hybrid catheter technologies um, are a, a growth area that will likely offer improved diagnostic capabilities um, in the future. So for the rest of the talk, I'll share some of my uh, research uh, that I've been doing in the past few years on catheter-based near-infrared fluorescence molecular imaging or NERF imaging, and I hope to show you some uh, examples of how NERF molecular imaging is a highly complementary piece of the puzzle uh, to structural imaging with IVIS and OCT or OCT. So here's a you know, very simple example, but it shows the potential power of NERF imaging. This is borrowed from oncology. So this color image shows a view of a surgical field in a patient with metastatic ovarian cancer who is planned to go undergo uh, cytoreductive surgery. 
And now um, just simply compare um, that to the detail you see after administering a tumor targeted NERF agent using an intraoperative NERF camera. It's really just, you know, night and day. And, you know, of course, you know, moving this to the coronary space does present, you know, more challenges than uh, um, looking at uh, gross, gross uh, pathology, but um, uh, uh, the overall framework um, uh, is required is similar. You need an imaging detection system and you need uh, something to detect. So um, this was tackled uh, uh, by Gary Tierney and Farouk Jaffer um, to create a hybrid OCT NERF imaging platform. And um, I would just say one of the significant challenges was to develop, to, was to design the device, um, was to divine, design this component in the middle called the rotary junction which basically integrates laser light from the nerf arm and the OCT arm and deliver this down a specialized optical fiber up to the plaque. They solved this problem and ultimately successful and uh, were able to validate the system and experimental plaques shown here at the bottom, um, which showed good correlation between areas of high nerf inflammatory activity, that's the yellow area here, and histological markers. So several years later, um, I was uh, fortunate to be in, involved in helping to develop a sister system uh, uh, and validate this. Um, this was a novel IVIS nerve imaging system designed to be capable of both coronary and peripheral applications. Uh, we performed a lot of extensive validation in different preclinical pre animal models. Um, here's one example shown here where we implanted a fluorescently labeled fiber encoded stent into the right corner area of a pig, and we're able to easily detect that with IVIS nerve imaging. So in addition to um, the detection system, um, you also need a nerve agent um, as a reporter of a particular biology of interest. And um, you know, one easy way to do that is just to look at tissue autofluorescence. Um, all tissues have native autofluorescent properties. These are wavelength and composition dependent. Um, and so that's a fairly straightforward option, and I'll show you some uh, results in uh, human clinical testing um, that were done uh, 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 later on in the talk. But um, if you want to be more specific, a targeted agent is needed. And there's a lot of really interesting, novel, preclinical agents out there. Um, but uh, uh, Farouk, uh, uh, Farouk's group, and, and including myself, I really try to focus on those um, uh, agents shown here that have uh, more more high higher translational potential and those being either already FDA approved such as into signing green um, <clears throat> or that have been you know where at least the backbones have been tested safely in human clinical trials um, like uh, ProSense VM 110. So um, like I mentioned I'll touch briefly on autofluorescence also talk a little bit about ICG um, later and some first in human work that I've done but First, I'll go through uh, some of the preclinical data we've collected on uh, black progression and stent healing for the cathepsin protease reporter ProSense. Um, but first, before I do it, uh, just briefly, here's how ProSense works. It's a large agent. It consists of many fluorochromes that are packed very tightly onto polylysine backbone. The tight packing um, uh, makes the agent non-fluorescent and optically silent at a baseline. However, when it interacts with activated proteases in tissue, <clears throat> that's when um, the fluorochromes are released and becomes brightly fluorescent and detectable. And ProSense is a great example of what's called an activity probe, meaning the fluorescence is only released if the protease is active in tissue. It also is a great example of how amplification strategies can work to increase signal to noise um, for nerf imaging, since you only really need a small amount of protease to generate a large amount of fluorescence. So, you know, why is Proteus inflammation potentially important? Well, um, in, a, in a broader sense, inflammation promotes atherothrombosis, um, it's pretty well established, but there's been a longstanding interest in inflammation as a driver of plaque progression and complications. And in particular, activated tissue proteases like the cathepsins, which is what ProSense reports on, uh, in particular known to be bad actors and linked to plaque changes and instability. So um, operationally and practically, the development of an OC, of OCT nerve uh, intracoronary imaging technology allowed us finally the opportunity to study this process in living subjects. So we designed a serial OCT nerve imaging study to look at the natural history between experimental plaque growth and nerve ibis, uh, nerve protease inflammation. 
Um, plot, plot growth was assessed with IVUS over a total period of 12 to 16 weeks in a preclinical rabbit model um, uh, where atherosclerosis was induced by local balloon injury and a high fat diet. And then nerve proteus inflammation was evaluated serially with ProSense first at eight weeks and then again four to eight weeks later. So here's a representative example, um, eight weeks after balloon injury. This is the balloon injury zone where atherosclerosis develops. And by nerve imaging, there's a heterogeneous nerve proteus infl inflammation that's present in the injured zone, but not in the non-injured, non-athero zone outside. Um, <clears throat> areas of high nerve signal are represented here by yellow and low areas are blue. On the right are axial sections from within the plaque and outside the plaque with correlative fluorescence microscopy and histology. And then if we focus in on sections um, within the plaque where nerve inflammation is either high or low at baseline, um, what we found is that high nerve inflammation, such as this area here, associates with greater IVUS plaque growth. Um, demonstrated in these panels at the top. In comparison, in the bottom, bottom panel of images, areas with low nerve plaque inflammation um, <clears throat> tended to exhibit less plaque progression over time. And if we put this all together um, in this uh, preclinical study, the take home message is really that using OCT nerve imaging, um, at least in this experimental model, there's a reasonable relationship between uh, plaque nerve inflammation signal and the likelihood that the plaque will tend to expand over time. Um, we did some additional analysis, I'm not showing that here, using adjusted uh, multivariate um, analysis in over 1700 axial images, um, accounting for plaque burden, baseline plaque burden, cholesterol, luminary, and remodeling, and the relationship held up. And I would mention that in comparison, all of the plaque structural metrics um, that were evaluated in the study um, really had no such predictive uh, capability um, like nerve inflammation imaging. Of course, there's many uh, limitations of this work. Um, it's a preclinical model, it develops relatively early stage lesions. So um, uh, it does need to be studied in more complex plaque environments you know, akin to human atheroma. So on a larger clinical scale, I thought I'd just, you know, at this point highlight two studies um, from the New England Journal that have sparked some uh, increased interest in links between inflammation and cardiovascular events. Uh, Cantos uh, study, um, as you probably all know, from a few years ago, randomized over 10,000 patients with prior MI that had high residual blood inflammatory CRP levels, um, despite medical therapy, to either placebo or three different doses of canakinumab which is a monoclonal antibody inhibitor of uh, IL-1 beta pro-inflammatory cytokine. And the results demonstrated a significant reduction in the combined primary endpoint of death MI and stroke, uh, driven primarily by a reduction in non-fatal MI. Um, there was a penalty, however, with canakinumab treatment of more fatal infections. Another trial, uh, Colcott, which, uh, was, which came out last year, showed promise in nearly 5,000 patients randomized to low dose, a strategy of low-dose oral colchicine or placebo within 30 days after MI. Now, similar to canakinumab, um, colchicine also has effects on the IL-1 inflammatory pathway. Um, the results from this trial showed a significant reduction in the composite primary endpoint, which was um, uh, uh, in the colchicine-treated arm, and it's mainly a product of less angio-related urgent rehospitalization and stroke. Um, there are also uh, increased incidence of infections in, uh, in the study uh, in the colchicine-treated group. In this case, it was primar primarily pneumonias. So moving back to um, uh, interventional domain here, um, uh, there is additional data to suggest that colchicine may have um, efficacy in treating stent or in preventing stent restenosis both for its anti-inflammatory properties and also anti-proliferative capacity inhibiting smooth muscle cells. So this was a randomized trial of about 200 diabetic patients. They were given twice daily um, half milligram colchicine uh, and this resulted in less late lumen loss um, compared to placebo um, at follow-up six months. And when they stratified this further according to angiographic or IVUS criteria, there was almost a 50% reduction in restenosis at six months follow-up in the colchicine-treated arm. 
Uh, so based on um, this data, we, we decided to perform a preclinical OCT nerve study uh, in a cohort of normal rabbits that were implanted with clinical stents in their aorta to assess relationships between stent inflammation and serial nerve proteus imaging in OCT neoantima growth. So half of the rabbits in this study were treated with daily oral colchicine starting one day prior to stent implantation until study completion. Um, in a non-colchicine treated control animal, um, restenosis uh, tends to develop at regions with high, uh, high early nerve proteus inflammation. Um, <clears throat> and this occurs primarily at the stent edges as shown here in this one dimensional plot of nerve fluorescence for two and six weeks. Focally on axial sections at the right, areas of high nerve, nerve inflammation signal in yellow, this area and this area, tend to develop in rich neointima thickness on follow-up imaging in, uh, in the region shown by the arrowheads. And when looking across the stent length in a piecewise fashion, every 0.4 millimeters, there's a pretty close tracking between nerve inflammation in red and OCT uh, neointima formation in blue. And when we pull this together at the level of the whole stent, a moderate correlation, and we found a moderate correlation between baseline nerve inflammatory signal and neointima growth over time. Of course, you know, further validation of this needs to be uh, performed, but it suggests that measuring stent nerve inflammation at a single time point may allow us to predict um, subsequent uh, uh, restenosis response of a stent. So then we examine what happens when you add daily oral colchicine to the mix, and does this suppress in vivo nerve proteus inflammation? Um, as shown here, uh, colchicine administration in the bottom notably tamps down the stent inflammatory response two weeks after implantation. And if we quantify this in more detail on a per stent basis, there's a significant reduction in nerve inflammation, um, predominantly at the stent edges, but also in the mid stent. Um, correlative fluorescence microscopy at the stent edges of um, excised stents showed a supportive data of less nerve inflammatory signal. Um, shown here in red in the colchicine group. So finally, in, in concert with the diminished nerve inflammation signal, we observed a significant reduction across the board in OCT neointima formation in the colchicine group. Uh, this was true when looking across the entire length of the stent, um, as shown here, uh, colchicine being in red, um, essentially flat, and also sub-segmentally at the edges or the middle. So at least in this preclinical environment, um, we think OCT nerve shows promise for evaluating stent restenosis potential, um, and possibly colchicine may show potential as an anti-restenosis therapy. But I would caution that before you go out and start, you know, giving all your PCI patients colchicine, um, there's always a trade-off to anti-inflammatory therapies. And in our study, um, this was um, data that uh, uh, Marie France um, helped uh, helped analyze in a blinded fashion. We did not see more infections uh, like in Cantos or Colcott, but colchicine did lead to delayed stent healing by OCT with greater stent strut exposure up to six weeks in rabbits. Um, this is a human equivalent of about six to 12 months. But granted, you know, this is an animal model. Um, it's a normal host. It develops overall pretty mild restenosis. Um, this would be something to, important to study further, probably by intracoronary imaging, uh, interest in colchicine or another similar agent grows. So the final example um, I wanted to show, it's just more of a, a fun example, is what happens if we aggressively implant an oversized stents. Um, in other words, you know, as long as you don't dissect or perforate the vessel, is bigger really better? And I bring this up because um, it's something we talk about not infrequently um, still to this day at uh, interventional conference. Um, you know, an oversized stent is what we call an interventional speak, a, a pig and a python. Um, and um, there are some older preclinical studies suggesting that deep strut embedment in the vessel wall, overstretch injury, uh, can lead to laceration of the elastic lamina, enhanced median adventitial inflammation, and that might be detrimental over time. And while most of us agree that right-sizing the stents the best strategy, um, we thought it would be kind of interesting at least to, in a pilot study, to take a look at with OCT nerve imaging and see whether there may be a detectable penalty for oversizing. So to get at this question, we conducted a very small pilot study looking at three different imaging, image guided stent techniques with increasingly aggressive implantation. Uh, in group one, we used standard balloon angioplasty followed by stenting at a one-to-one -one stent artery ratio. Uh, 
That's the right size stent group. Group two used a cutting balloon, which is essentially a standard balloon with small blades on the side to slice the plaque, followed by one-to-one -one stenting. And then finally, group three used a standard balloon uh, up front, followed by oversized stenting at a 1.3 to one stent to artery ratio. And then immediately after stent implantation, we administered uh, indocinine green, uh, which allowed us to evaluate the degree of endothelial barrier compromise followed by uh, ProSense uh, uh, nerve inflammation imaging at two and six weeks um, to see how the early injury corresponded with neointima development. And here's an example of a representative rabbit um, with three stents. These are three stents implanted serially in the iliac artery um, under the three different conditions. And the subsequent nerve maps for ICG and ProSense um, uh, at baseline two and six weeks. And what we found was that ICG at the ICG uh, detection at the time of stenting showed greater endothelial permeability in the more aggressive balloon injury groups shown here on the right, followed by um, uh, nerve inflammation image showing a gradual reduction uh, over time. And we, we pulled these together, um, although we could not detect a significant difference in nerve stent inflammation at two weeks, which um, I suspected may be the case. Um, possibly just due to being underpowered um, in the study, but um, we did find that more aggressive injury at the time of stent implantation based on ICG imaging um, led to a greater uh, OCT new internal hyperplasia response down the road at six weeks. And interestingly, using the cutting balloon to lacerate the vessel wall before the stent was implanted led to the greatest amount of new intima and that's perhaps a response to the deep medial injury that we, we observed in those, in those animals. This data, of course, is just hypothesis generating, but um, there may be some potential future applications for corner care ICG nerve imaging to understand um, endothelial permeability and lesion preparation uh, in certain cases. So uh, moving back for the final piece here um, to translation of OCT nerve imaging, um, you know, how can we move this more towards the clinic? Um, we showed you a lot of preclinical data up until this point. Um, the first hurdle, of course, is to demonstrate that the catheter system can safely image um, <clears throat> within, the human, within human coronaries. Um, and uh, this work was done by um, Giovanni Ugi as well as Gary Tierney and Rick Jaffer. And, Here's an example of what a uh, OCT, what we call OCT NIRAF, uh, looking at autofluorescence um, in the uh, left anterior descending coronary uh, looks like. You know, there's a few focal areas of mild autofluorescence that occur, um, two of them associated with calcification based on OCT imaging, and a third a brighter area that um, located at an area where a thin cap fiber, fiber atheroma was present. So OCT NERF overall has now been uh, performed successfully and safely in 12 patients. And um, there's still work going on about um, what the source for the autofluorescent signal is. Uh, but subsequent studies have suggested that um, this may, in fact, um, identify areas where of, of heme degradation, degradation projects, uh, products from intraplaque hemorrhage and particularly bilirubin. And so it may be able to image in certain cases high-risk plaque features. And though autofluorescence demonstrates some pro promise, um, you know, there's still some questions, like I said, about what are we detecting and what's the specificity and clinical utility of just looking at autofluorescence in tissue. So really, I think to take nerve imaging to the next level, we also need to be able to have a targeted nerve agent that can safely image um, key biology in human plaques and give value beyond what we can already see by structural imaging alone. And that's still being worked out, but uh, one potential candidate is in assigning green, an FDA approved agent has a long, uh, long uh, track record of safety. Um, and in preclinical rabbit atherosclerosis models, um, uh, ICG was shown to enter plaques and associated with uh, ramelin-positive ramelin macrophages as well as neutral lipids um, by histology. Um, it also has properties of a fast elimination half-life, so it gets into the plaques rapidly within a few minutes of intravenous administration, and that makes uh, use for point-of-care applications particularly attractive. So we performed a, a first-in-human clinical trial, a pilot trial of ICG administration to five patients. Um, that had severe but stable carotid disease. 
who were uh, undergoing a planned surgical carotid endarterectomy procedure. And we injected ICG in the holding area uh, preoperatively using clinically approved doses. Um, there were no adverse events in the study. And then we went to the OR and picked up the surgically resected plaques about an hour and a half after the ejection and took them back to the lab for benchtop OCT nerve imaging, as well as doing cordylate histology and fluorescence imaging to see where the ICG um, ended up. And what we discovered from this study was that ICG entered into plaques at areas where the endothelium was compromised, shown here by the absence of CD31 staining. And then it would lodge in these areas um, uh, where uh, associated with macrophages on 60 CD68 stains as well as lipid pools. And even though, as I mentioned, the enrolled patients had clinically stable severe carotid disease, we in fact did find evidence of subclinical plaque rupture in some patients, as is shown in the inset here, um, where ICG was also present and it was readily detectable by OCT nerve imaging. We also found further evidence that ICG is a marker of impaired endothelial barrier function um, located within intraplaque hemorrhage zones um, next to outside the lumen, um, as well as leaky plaque neovessels that were identified by CD31 stain. So finally, um, in the last part here, we, we and others have also demonstrated that in preclinical swine uh, atherosclerosis models that ICG is readily detectable within the coronary arteries um, pretty quickly, um, within uh, 30 minutes of intravenous administration. And so, you know, overall, you know, while more work is needed, um, the studies here kind of serve to, serve to form a foundation, at least for considering applications for human clinical OCT nerve trials and possibly also for using ICG uh, as a marker of endothelial permeability. So um, I'll end here just a quick summary of, of Part two, um, molecular um, nerve imaging, I think complements current structural imaging modalities, provides additional pathobiological data in vivo. I uh, showed some examples of nerve protease inflammation imaging uh, related to plaque progression and restenosis. Um, and I think, you know, at least the foundational elements are now in place, um, uh, but future work, of course, is needed in order to identify what are the key areas for potential clinical nerve uh, imaging applications. Um, which ideally would be kind of point of care applications, I think. And so we're still kind of working, working out, you know, those details as we hopefully move, move this more towards uh, clinical reality. So I'll end here. I just want to say, you know, in closing, um, certainly pretty exciting time, I think, for intracoronary imaging. It's a lot of new technologies. There's a lot of room for growth in the field. Of course, want to, you know, thank, you know, all the colleagues and amazing people you know that I work with especially thank you know Rob Peter uh, Dwayne Don uh, Bobby Chang Yu at the Smith Center for their help with some of the plaque inflammation project Marie France for work on the colchicine study and so many countless others um, I also want to give special thanks to my research mentor Farouk Jaffer as well as Gary Tierney and you know all the collaborators inside and outside of their labs that I've been so fortunate to work with over the years that have helped move all these projects forward. So I'll end there and thanks so much for, uh, for listening in today. Thank you, Eric. That was excellent. Um, we have a number of questions and comments that have come in. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll stick with the ones that have already been uh, submitted. And if there are additional questions, please feel free to contact uh, Dr. Osborne directly. Um, and so there's a cluster of questions around cost. Um, so Joe had asked, how much time is added to the procedure with OCT and what is the added cost to the procedure? On a related note, Dan had asked about any idea of cost effectiveness, effectiveness of IVIS or OCT in either ACS or more elective settings. And Kazi has a comment that FFR and FAME is the only recent example of a cost-saving intervention in cardiology. My intuition is that OCT IVIS is cost-effective from a societal perspective, but whether it works for each of the stakeholders depends on how long it takes and what reimbursement looks like, particularly for ACS inpatients. Hard to incentivize uptake unless MDs get paid for it, though. Um, so, Eric, it'd be great if you could comment on both time as well as cost. Yeah, those are all really great points and a lot of great insights um, from people that know a lot more about cost effectiveness than I do. And so, <laughs> um, 
I'd love to get some additional insights on that. But, you know, I would say that, you know, we are reimbursed for imaging. Um, it's not a huge amount, but um, catheters themselves, I think, cost around, you know, five, you know, six hundred dollars or so. It's fairly similar to um, FFR um, wires. And, you know, there have been some uh, cost effectiveness studies. I mean, if you think about it, if you're able to, you know, uh, have a significant reduction in the need for the patient to come back to the lab for review, the revascularization procedure. Um, if that holds true, I think, you know, um, it's pretty logical, you know, to uh, suspect that, you know, it actually is a cost effective strategy in certain patients. You know, I would say that, um, you know, as much of a fan as imaging as I am, you know, I don't know that in fact it needs to be 100% use. Um, I think that's probably overkill. Um, but I think there's a sweet spot that we're still trying to figure out. I mean, we know which patients probably benefit the most. Um, we could make a list of those very easily, you know, the restenosers, right? So, you know, diabetics, um, chronic kidney disease, et cetera, long lesions, small vessels, um, you know, people that have, you know, previously restenosed. And in those ones, I think, you know, um, that's where the biggest bang for the buck lies. And so, um, and so, um, and then I also told you when I talk, when we talk about time, you know, one of the things that we're learning from Light Lab and um, is that by some of these workflow changes that um, it can really just add, you know, a matter of maybe five minutes or so um, to the procedure, especially with OCT. To collect the data, in fact, takes three seconds. You can get a whole pullback in three seconds. Most of it goes into the effort to look at the data and then figure out what to do. Um, so, you know, if you come in for a procedure, you know it's an imaging procedure. If you have all the equipment set up, then actually collecting the data and analyzing it really should only take, you know, a few minutes and shouldn't add a lot of time to the procedure. And that's something that they're, they're looking at a quantitative basis in the light lab initiative. So we should have more data on that. Great. And a question from Jim Wilson. What is the ethnic diversity of the imaging registries? That's a great question. Um, I'd have to go back and look at that. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, a lot of this is done um, uh, in Asia. So the penetrance of imaging in Asia is very high. Um, but uh, it's a great question. That's, you know, um, I think, you know, potentially important. And a final question from Robert Gersten. Are there any major differences in, manu in maneuverability of OCT versus ibis based catheters? Not really. Uh, I mean, there are slight, so OCT catheters tend to be smaller, um, slightly, you know, in uh, 2.7, 2.9 French range, whereas the IVIS catheters are, you know, three French and change. Um, you know, I think some of the designs do play into their pushability. Um, so OCT just came out with a new catheter design that um, we uh, were one of the first sites to get. Um, in the past couple months, and just anecdotally, I found that some of the changes in the stiffness of the tip and the um, deliverability are much better with the new design. Um, you know, some of the bulkier uh, catheters with IVIS, um, uh, you know, um, can be a little bit more challenging in, in torturous anatomy, but for the most part, they're all relatively, relatively similar. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for uh, um, giving a fantastic grand rounds. Um, our next session will be in September. So hope everyone enjoys the summer and we'll be in touch with more details as to uh, what the actual uh, conference is going to look like. Um, we're, we're waiting to see how things go over the summer, um, but please look for an email about that. Um, so thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.